But our challenges are all related to our prosperity and growth. Almost all of them. Everything we do is a growth problem. It's all a math problem. The part of what we're witnessing here today is we are a victim of our own success. And you are looking at a metropolitan statistical area here that's going to approach a million people in 2040, 2045. Everything that we have to think about has to relate to that. Listening to The Underview, an exploration of the shaping of our place. My name is Mike Rush, and my guest today is Benton County Judge Barry Mooring. Our topic is the state of Benton County, where we have come from, where we're going, and the challenges and opportunities ahead. This discussion relates to our previous episode about the challenges facing our region. However, today we take one step closer to my home county as a way to understand how our county is being shaped. Judge Mooring also takes the opportunity to flip the script on me a little bit. So I make an ultimate ask as it relates to the future of gravel cycling in Northwest Arkansas. And while that's not the main point of the conversation, it's an important point. Talk to you after the show. Judge Mooring, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for sitting with me. I'm glad to have you dip into these conversations. And been thankful we've had the opportunity to know each other for for many many years probably more years than either one of us would want to admit but thank you for yeah you know, thank you for coming and sitting with me this morning absolutely tell me your story i'd love to hear your your story of who you are and how you got to this place well that's a a long story but i'll sum it up i i was i was born in tucson arizona and i won't go back to the the history there but i think I think probably for the purposes of this discussion, what's important is that 1998, 1999, my wife and I, through a very strange set of circumstances, were given the opportunity to come to Northwest Arkansas. And both of us worked for Walmart in the Walmart home office. And, and we decided to do that. We had a two-year-old and a three-week-old baby when we got here on Valentine's Day, 1999. And... We looked at each other. We had a rental house over off of Walton. And what we remember the most about the rental house is bright red carpet on Valentine's Day. It was unbelievable. But we looked at each other. We said, five years. We're going to stay here five years. We're going to live in Arkansas and, and we're going to work for Walmart for five years. And then we're out of here. Because our, our lives prior to that had been, we moved here from Phoenix. And before that, we were in Washington, D.C. And we could never have envisioned living in a place like Bentonville, Arkansas. And, and now, nearly 25 years later, here we are. This is the longest we've ever lived in one place. We have no plans of going anywhere. I'm not sure what would ever pry us away from here. It wouldn't be career choices at this point. And we've raised three great kids. We've gotten involved in our community. We've been involved in our church. We've had great career tracks. And we're thankful beyond measure that we ended up in Northwest Arkansas. But when we came here, we would never have thought that. In fact, we didn't think that. And now here we are. It's been phenomenal. What changed in that decision to say we're going to we're going to make this home? It had all, everything to do with raising our kids. I mean, so so don't get me wrong. We we both had really great opportunities at Walmart. I was in marketing. My wife was an attorney. She was in legal. But man, we we lived five to ten minutes away. We were able to coach ball teams. We were able to show up for school events, and the quality of life was just phenomenal more than anything else. In Phoenix, you know, we were 45 minutes away. I worked in downtown Phoenix and we lived in an area in Phoenix called Ahwatukee. She worked, my wife worked in downtown Phoenix and, and the sheer quality of life was phenomenal for us. And we're not the kind of people that needed, you know, we don't need professional sports teams. We don't, we didn't need a lot of that. What we needed is a good, you know, farm family foundation, a nice, decent place to live, a good place to work and the way to get back and forth. And we had that. And it just kind of evolved. I mean, five years became 10 years and then 
would never consider, or we would never consider actually going anywhere else. It was awesome. So this sounds like home. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Arizona will always be my homeland and my family still lives. A lot of my family still lives in Tucson. And so we go back and visit Tucson, but you know, our, I have no plans to retire to Tucson like a lot of people do. Now we'll, we'll run out, we'll run out the clock here. I'm quite sure. What do you think if you can even summarize it? What is it about that makes this place home today? 25 years later, if I remember correctly, that kind of holds you in this place. You know, it's not so much about career opportunities anymore because we've had those. So, you know, we ran out the meat of our career, if you will, here. It's really about quality of life. It's about, I think the, the people are genuinely friendly here. I think that it's a pretty welcoming community and, and welcoming means a lot of things. But for us, it's, we've got a lot of friends. We can make new friends. We, we love the activities that are available here. We also love the proximity. And just, you know, we lived in hard places. Phoenix is a hard place to live. Phoenix is a megalopolis. DC is a hard place to live. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but, but the, weather, the weather's pretty good here. And so we, we just love it. Love the climate. I mean, I don't miss the desert. Thought I would. I don't, but it's great. Can you tell me, so we're sitting in your office this morning. Can you tell me a little bit about where we are? Sure. Arkansas. So we're in the, we're in the Bett County Administration Building in all of its glory. Basically, this building was built by Judge Bruce Rutherford a couple of decades ago. It's basically a Lego block. We don't, we don't shoot for design awards here at the county. And, and this is the county judge's office here in the corner. But this is the, this is the heart of county administration here in Bentonville. Bentonville's our county seat. You mentioned D.C. I know you've got a background, obviously in business, but you also have a background in public servant, if I can use that term, if that's fair. Can you tell me a little bit about that background? So I went to the University of Arizona and really caught the bug to be involved with things political. And, and so one of the things I did while I was at the University of Arizona is I did five different political government internships. And one of those was to go to DC to be a, an intern for Senator DeConcini just for my senior year. And that's where I met my wife, Cindy. She was a set intern for Senator Bond from Missouri. And we met in DC as interns back when DC intern was fairly scandalous. But after I graduated school, I wanted to work on the Hill. And so I went back and worked on Capitol Hill for four years while my, my wife went to law school back there and, and loved it. It was, I mean, working on Capitol Hill as a staffer, worked for two different members from Arizona. I worked on a lot of great policy issues, worked for a lot of great committees. I worked for the Appropriations Committee for a couple of years for Congressman Colby from Arizona. Just probably the greatest experience ever. But when, but when it came time to grow up, we didn't want to stay in D.C. We didn't want to try to buy a home there and raise a family there. So we went back to Arizona after that. But yeah, out of school, I went and worked on the Hill for about four years. So you stepped into serving our community here as the, as the county judge. What led to that decision? It's interesting because I had a mentor of mine at our church named Tim Summers. And Tim knew a little bit that I had a political background. But by, by then, I'd been here a number of years. I, when we moved here, I had no political aspirations whatsoever. When I left Arizona, I figured I'd left those all behind in my aspirations here, career and business oriented. But he talked me into running for this thing called the Quorum Court. I didn't even know what that was. And he said, no, no worries. It's basically like county commission. You get your name out there, you'll run. It'll be fine. Pretty much nobody even runs for it. Well, I, that didn't happen. <laughs> it was in 2012, I ended up running and I went and had coffees and stuff with people. When it came time to file, I had not one, but two individuals file against me. Gentleman named Will Hanna, who's still very respected here in the community. Will's, Will, his wife, Waltina, great people. And Tim Cook, who was police captain. And at the time, Will was actually the fire marshal for Bent County. And Tim was captain up in Bella Vista. And I went home to my family and I said, okay, told you I was going to run for this thing. And I thought it would be pretty easy. But guess what? I have two opponents now. And you're going to see dad had a little different gear here because I had actually managed campaigns in my previous life. And I've been pretty successful at that. And so I said, look, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to really put it into fifth gear here. And I'll never forget my son, Bennett said, well, who are you running against? And then I said, well, a gentleman named Will Hanna, he's the fire marshal at Benton County, a gentleman named Tim Cook, he's the police captain at Bella Vista. And my son looked at me and said, oh man, you're toast. <laughs> <laughs> but I ended up winning in a row. And, and Will and I actually became friends over that. He's awesome. And that was back when you could run for office and shake hands afterwards. And. 
and I did the quorum court thing for a couple of terms and decided that if I was going to be involved in county government, it was something that interests me. Then I wanted to run for the county judge job. That's the CEO job. And we had a person who was judge at the time who, frankly, I had some differences of opinion on policy with and ran against him in a primary and prevailed. Tough campaign, but, but that's democracy. All right. Well, let's fast forward to today because I'm curious when you think and you've seen this place grow, what are your top thoughts and the challenges and opportunities for Benton County? So first of all, we're one of 75 counties. I wouldn't trade my problems for any of theirs. So let's, let's just start there. Not that we don't have problems, but I get asked that question all the time and I have to think about it because I want to put it in the context of the problems that we get to work on here, that in Chico County or Searcy County, they don't get to work on those problems. So we'll, we'll start. But our challenges are all related to our prosperity and growth. Almost all of them. You can go down the list, whether it's things that we have to deal with, with stormwater and flooding or in law enforcement or in detention or in providing for streets and roads or enough schools or sewage, sewer treatment. Everything we do is a growth problem. It's all a math problem. But part of what we're witnessing here today is we are a victim of our own success in that I can show you a chart that will take you back to around the year 2000. In Northwest Arkansas, regional planning for the year 2020 was planning on about 185,000 people in Benton County. And we missed that by about 100,000. So it was nearly 300,000 people here in the latest sense. In Washington County, you know, their chart would look similar too. And you are looking at an MSA here, a metropolitan statistical area here that's going to approach a million people in 2040, 2045. Everything that we have to think about has to relate to that. And so that, you know, you can spill almost any challenge we have from there. But, but as, as my former mayor, mentor, and friend, Bob McCaslin would say, it sure beats the alternative. And that's unfortunately what other parts of the state are dealing with is they're dealing with decline. They're dealing with a declining population, a declining tax base, a declining level of prosperity. And so I actually think they have a, a bigger challenge than we have. In this challenge that's driven by really the growth of the region, how does that relate? What are these challenges that relate to us as we think about how we use the land of Benton County? And the background are really kind of where I want to kind of ask you to go is as the cities grow and moves into once was county space, what are some of the challenges we face as we think about how we use our land here? So you, you've got two opposing forces at play here. We are a very strong property rights oriented community and area. That's, that's fine. What that means is that the way that we're structured from a legal standpoint and how cities portray their growth does not lead to quality land use planning. And you can argue, and the arguments can certainly be made, well, but that's what this population wants. If I own property out on the west side, I'd be able to do whatever I want with them. Fair enough. By, by that being the case, then what we get, and I, I know you can't see this on audio, is you get a map that looks like this. And so we don't have a master plan for land use in Benton County. And the way county government is structured versus the cities, we're not empowered to do that legally. So cities really get to call their shots on how they are going to grow. And in some, I think, grow more rationally than others. And I think a lot of cities have master plans and things like that, but those plans only look at things within their boundaries whether it's their actual city limits or their, their extraterritorial boundary. And what that means is we, we have not to be critical of cities because that's what they're elected to do, but, but cities really are looking at this myopically when you think about something happening regionally and people will look to the county to see if there's something we can do about that. And frankly, the way we're legally structured, we are not in the annexation approval any business anymore. Basically, annexations get approved nearly automatically. And the way those annexations get approved is something that we don't have any input in. And so you end up with, unfortunately, what I see happening in Benton County is similar to what has happened in the Phoenix area. You could almost drive 100 miles east to west, north to south in the greater Phoenix area. And the differences between Tempe and Chandler and Gilbert and Apache Junction and Mesa and Phoenix, the vast majority of that population doesn't care. They're just going back and forth and living their life. But you've ended up with this unfettered growth out there. And it's a huge metropolitan megalopolis place. But, but the switch is 
Arizona is a very much free property state, and that's the way they've chosen to be. And that seems to be the way that we've chosen here. I'm not going to say that's either right or wrong, but that is, that is the path that we seemingly have chosen. Talk, talk a little bit more about some of the challenges around this land use or planning between the cities and the county. Where do you feel that you can be proactive in this space, or do you feel like the county are being reactive to what's happening? Can you talk a little more about that? I would say from a policy standpoint, strategically, we're, we're pretty much entirely reactive. And again, I'm not going to say that's necessarily a bad thing, but we don't have zoning in the county, for example, and there, there will be zoning in the county. I don't see that as, as far as I can see. We do have a planning code and, and the planning code governs land use when you want to apply for a, a permit and, and alter it. So if you want to build a storage facility or if you want to build Manufacturing facility. We do have planning codes. For, we have building codes to inspect that. But as far as as being in a position where we help people what to do with their property, we're not in a position to do that. And I'm not sure we should be. It's also unique that a lot of other places have a lot of property that will never be developed, whether it's forest area or some other kind of, of area. We have some of that on the east side. Obviously, the lake water. We have Hop State Park. I mean, we have some buffering, but if you look basically from the lake to Oklahoma, it's all private property, almost all of it. And so, you know, we're not, we're not in a position to tell people what to do or not do with their property. What does that mean? That means a panda that 10 years ago would have gotten X amount for their acreage will now get Y amount. And if you're a dairy farmer and you've been getting up at four in the morning and you've been busting your butt, frankly, to break even, or maybe a little bit more in some years not, and somebody's going to come write you a big check and you're going to get to live out the rest of your life not having to do that, that's going to happen. And that's why we have virtually no dairy farms left in Benton County. At one point, we had the most in the state, I believe. I think we had over 100. And then that property, you see it, whether it's used for subdivisions or warehouses or, you know, and a lot of times it's within an annexation space from a city. And that's the way this is happening here. Do you think there are different priorities between what the municipalities are trying to do versus maybe residents of the county? What mm -hmm. Can you compare what those priorities may be? You know, There's a lot of tension between rural agriculture, Benton County, and urbanizing Benton County. And I think if you were to do a poll, the urbanizing Benton County is winning them. When I started on the coral court, so this has been about 10 years ago, I think almost 24% of our population was in unincorporated Benton County. That is now 15%. So very relatively few people live outside of a city limit now. And as these cities grow, particularly with the, with arguably the boom that we've had here the past, you know, since we came out of the Great Recession, which, which hit us here, but didn't hit us as bad, badly as some other places, land values, housing values, it's just more than somebody who's had land can walk away from. I mean, you're not, you're not doing yourself or your family or your, your heirs any favor by walking away from that. And so that's what, that's what's happening. We're definitely becoming a more urbanized county. And that does create tension because there's a lot of resistance. Is there certain areas of the county that seem to be having to deal with this more or less than other? The west. The west side. Yeah, I think it's. So in the east side, basically I have three, the way I define it, I think we have three zones in the county. You've got the lake. You've got the 49 corridor and just take everything on 49 and go five to eight miles on either side. And then you've got the West. The West side is some of the best agriculturally and in the, maybe the world. We have some of the best farmers in the world. We're the number one agriculture county in the state of Arkansas. A lot of people don't realize. But it is, it is becoming harder to be a farmer by virtue of the opportunity cost that you're passing up. And so that's where geographically, I think a lot of our challenge there is, is that kind of that clash between growth. You know, I talked to our mayors on the West side and they're figuring out how do they accommodate new subdivisions? How do they accommodate the infrastructure for those subdivisions? Gradually that, that kind of that, that jigsaw puzzle grows out there. I don't want to characterize your comments. It, it feels like there's a little bit of maybe a sense that the progress and growth that we are seeing is, is going to continue and this is kind of not, not an impending inevitability of what's going to happen within the county. I mean, is that a fair statement? Do you feel like what is happening in the way growth is happening, the way that you potentially project it to be for the, for the next 20 years, that these problems are going to become greater and, and 
or are they preventable? I would almost say that some of these problems will simply become accepted and preventable. I'll go back to what I said originally. These are great problems to have. These, these are the problems born of prosperity and market forces. If you're the farmer that's now making the windfall by selling your property, this is not a problem for you at all. This is a, this is a tremendous opportunity. So I, I need to be careful on how I characterize it because for a lot of people, this is a, a, a game changing thing for their way of life. For the area as a whole, there's a lot of places that have gone through this and have come through it on the other side and they're, and they're, you know, prosperous, successful areas. Let me come back to Phoenix, for example. So arguably that Phoenix Scottsdale area is, I was just back there for what? It's dynamic. It's growing. They have all sorts of amenities. It's, I mean, it is, it is jamming in Phoenix. They've got it going on. There. And there's a lot of people there that love that. There's a lot of people that love living there. So for a lot of people, that's success. I mean, so you got to be careful to tee this up as problems because, because one person's problems and another person's, you know, success. What I think that means for us in the government sector is you have to be able to figure out how do you, how do you keep up with that and still provide the quality of life that people are expecting. And we are struggling there, but I, you know, I have to be careful to identify these as only problems. These are good problems to have. As you maybe pointed out earlier, this potential tension or this, these different types of communities, rural, if I, agricultural communities versus urban cities, municipalities, pardon me, that are growing. It changes the culture would be my assumption. There are values that are held by longtime Benton County landowners that they have formed and shaped over time. And as cities expand and what was a, maybe a farmland is now a subdivision, the communities that occupy these places now are maybe bringing different ideas, different values, different desires or needs into the, into those spaces. Is that an ongoing conversation within the government of Benton County? maybe has or does not have responsibility to help form and shape those communities? You know, it's interesting that that is happening. So certainly the characteristics of our community are changing. There are some cultural, I mean, Bentonville is probably the best example, right? But again, a lot of those kinds of cultural changes, at least from what I've seen, have been, have been pretty positive. I actually, in, in terms of, of people who have come here recently, in whatever way that they got here in whatever capacity versus the people who are still here. I would actually say the tension level there isn't that good. I will. Cool. I, I don't, I don't, you know, we're, and that goes back to what I said in the beginning. I, I still think we're pretty easygoing, accepting kind of community compared to what may be happening elsewhere. I can't, which I really can't speak to, but I, I don't actually sense too much tension or a clash of, of culture or conflict there. I'm sure it exists, but I think a lot of people are able to come here and assimilate and inculcate and be just fine. I'm not, you know, I'm not sensing there's as big a problem. And maybe it's just gone past me, but it doesn't land on my desk. As this kind of development continues to, to push out into areas of the county that have, could have been undeveloped land, as you think about kind of environmental concerns, the health of our yeah, environment, our waters, our, our watersheds, our streams, what do you see happening in those spaces from your point of view? Yeah. So I, I do think there's a concern there. Probably the most pronounced is what's going on with the Illinois River. You know, we still have this dispute with, with Oklahoma over the phosphorus levels. And a lot of that's related to the, to the, to the poultry industry have, we have here. But, but here's what's interesting about that. If you look at the charts that show the levels of phosphorus and other kinds of contaminants, they actually make tremendous progress there. And yet the poultry industry here stays very strong. And we've grown. And so I actually think relative to our growth, we've had a lot of progress there. I think generally our, our streams, if you want to go there, I think are, are clean. They're recreational. I think people enjoy them. And I think we're in, we're in pretty good shape. I think Beaver Lake generally in Beaver Lake water district does, they keep our drinking water safe. And I think we're in pretty good shape there. Growth is going to put a strain on that. And, and it's from the county perspective, probably where we see that strain the most is in stormwater drainage. You know, we have bank stabilization issues, but the actual health and safety and cleanliness of the water itself, while certainly something everybody has to pay attention to, I think we've actually done okay there considering the growth we've had. The outdoor recreation industry here in Northwest Arkansas is exploding, if I can use that, that word. 
I'd love to know what your perspective is about what that looks like as, as people are exploring new areas or using more and more people are going into new rural areas that have not been used before. Yeah, it is exploding. It's hard to argue that that hasn't been a tremendous benefit to the area. In terms of how it's affected rural Benton County, uh, what I see that is interesting there is probably where the tension has been the greatest is right there on the county road where, where a, a bike and a farm implement come face to face. Okay. For a number of years, we were getting pushed back from our rural area about primarily the gravel bikers being out there. And a coalition was formed, including the Farm Bureau and the Cooperative Extension and Benton County and the Runway Group that represents a lot of the biking community. And we worked together to just try to take that tension down. We call it Respect Rural Roads, which I think has been a great idea. And it's simple. It's a simple idea. I mean, we do a little bit of advertising. We put some signs out. But Farm Bureau lets their membership know. I've been at Farm Bureau meetings where they talk about this. And I know that the biking community talks about this. And, and what's been great to see is that, is that people are going to learn to live with each other. And now that's transitioning to people are starting to learn to figure out this is actually a pretty good deal. Not a, not a, not a bad thing to have bikers going by my house or my farm. And some of the other communities, Pea Ridge is a great example, where they're like, yeah, I think we better embrace this. This is, this is a great idea to have the biking community come to Pea Ridge. And we're seeing that in some of our other towns as well. So I actually think it's been a great thing. It also is at the county caused us to focus a little bit more on where are those bikers going? What roads are they on? Where do we need to pay attention? Whether it's potentially a flooding issue or some sort of other maintenance issue. And I think it's also going to, at some point, wouldn't say it's directly impacted this yet, but it's probably going to cause us to make some choices about what we do with some of those roads. And, and I think that's going to be set up death road. By that's going to be set up down the road. And what do we, what do we do with some of those roads? Because the recreation influence is going to be really important there. So I actually think it's been a, a net positive, but I do think it's taken a little bit of work. Yeah. Yeah. And full disclosure too, I think people that know me, I'm one of those gravel riders who has ridden just yeah, about every. Where you. Yeah. <laughs> is that? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm, is this, yeah, maybe, we, maybe actually you've called this meeting yeah. for me to <laughs> well, I am. Um, I'm am one of those people who loves going and riding out on our gravel roads. And well, what have you found that? Yeah. I, I don't want them to change selfishly. If I, if I reveal my point of view. Two questions. Yeah. For, let me ask you. Sure. Okay. okay. Here we go. It's one yeah. is how have you been received by the population, the folks that live out there? That's my first question. It's, I think we've seen that tension at times. Has it gotten better? To be determined. I think, okay. I think the initiatives that we've seen are, are spot on and that yep. it isn't, there's a lot, I don't think we give ourselves credit for the things that we actually have in common that we value yeah. um, around those spaces and the beauty of Benton County, the, the roads that are being used for commerce and agriculture and recreation, there is a vested interest in, in preserving those things because they, they're of great value. Huh. So, so the second question then is about whether or not we should pay more roads. Well, now I have, <laughs> I feel like I'm getting set up here a little bit yeah. because I, I, we have joked with our ride club that we should start an unimproved road society coalition that would actually ask that none of those roads be changed. And yeah. I would even go so far as to say, I would like to talk with whoever's in charge of the grading of the roads that maybe we could work closer That's together me. to, okay, well, <laughs> come right to the horse's mouth. There. Yeah. That there's probably different gravel qualities that we could talk through a little bit really? more. So Maybe the want, timing, the schedule. Wants to adjust our grading and gravel qualities for somebody who lives in the heart of Bentonville. So it's convenient for you when you happen to go out and visit these roads on your recreational job. I feel like if we could get that done, all of my questions around this podcast would be answered. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's fun. Let's talk about roads a little bit. So county judges, one of their nicknames is King of, King of the Roads, which is kind of funny. Yeah. So, now, I, I've not heard that. Yeah. And I may now be tested yeah. to, to use that forever now. <laughs> and, and I will tell you, I was, at, I was at an event a couple of years ago, and I'll just say a prominent member of the biking community was there. And he comes up and he says, you really need to stop paving all those roads. I said, what are you talking about? He said, we just, we just look at you and you're, you're just the, the 
guy that wants to pave all roads. And I had to remind him that actually we've paved very few unpaved miles of road in Bend County relative to previous years. And here's, here's how we score roads that we're going to either, let me back up some more. When I took office, we did a survey of all of our paved roads, a video survey of every square foot of pavement we have in Benton County. I'm happy to share that if you look at your list. There may be some people that would be interested so in seeing this. This is hundreds and hundreds of miles. And what we found out is nearly 50% of our paved road was substandard, cracking, potholing. And once you pave a road, you have automatically created a significant maintenance issue. It is a lot, a lot less expensive to keep track and, and groom an unpaved road than a paved road. So we had hundreds of miles of substandard road, and we've spent probably 90% of our effort on roads on fixing those roads, not on paving new roads. When we fix road or when we pave a road, we have basic criteria that didn't exist before. Real simple stuff like, well, how much traffic's on there? So we do traffic counts. We find out if school buses are on there. Do school bus routes go on there? What has been the pattern of emergency response on those roads? And, and have, have first responders been able to, to effectively get up and down those roads? And then we look at the cost-benefit analysis of doing anything to that road at all. Some roads would be $10,000 a mile, and some roads might be a million dollars a mile. I'm exaggerating on both ends. But, and then we determine what our road plan is for the year. Most of our road plan is redoing roads that are already paved. Very few times do we pave new road. Having said that, we'll make those determinations based on those needs. And, and so sometimes we do choose to pave a road but it's not as often as it used to be. What we don't put into that mix is the recreational use of that road. And in part, it might be because we're not aware of it. We might, we might intuitively know that or anecdotally know that, but take Sugar Creek Road. That's, we know that's a popular one with the bicycling community, but I don't know if that's popular with, you know, 200 people or 2000 people. So maybe we need to start taking that into account. But keep in mind also why those roads are there. Those, those roads are there primarily to move vehicles and to assist commerce. That's primarily why they're there. We're not gonna change our opinion on them. Yeah, I love this. This may push us into all of my biases. I, I have a list of roads I would like you to unpave if this is an ask. I have folks from your tribe that come to me all the time. <laughs> so there you go. Well, that's good. I, actually, it's super encouraging to hear that that's top of mind, just because I think part of some of these questions that we're exploring for this conversation are, how are people connected to this place? How are they connected to the land? What, what holds them in place? What holds them from loving this place and caring about it and investing in it? And there's no, there's no question that cycling and what cycling has done here in Northwest Arkansas is exposing people to parts of our community that, have, that they otherwise wouldn't. And sure. I think there's a responsibility of those cyclists to go and to use those roads with respecting them, to, to use that term. To, to know about them, to, to learn about them so that they can be enjoyed by more people in many ways. And so as we talk about progress and growth and cities expansion, and, and there's a, a whole lot of gravel roads that are no more, not necessarily because, of, not because of the county per se, but maybe just because of the growth of communities and subdivisions as they, as they move out. And so maybe selfishly you've revealed to me now, as I think through it, that maybe the whole goal of all of this is to, is to keep our gravel roads intact, but it's, it's something that I think is pertinent to our community discussions. So let me turn that back around. What's the plan? I've had this discussion with the cycling community. We, we want to facilitate all sorts of traffic on those roads. And again, I'll go back to just basic economics. It's a lot more efficient for taxpayers to maintain in, in good shape a dirt road, gravel road, than it is a paved road. So let's start there. But I've been asking different people in the cycling community for what their plan is for years. What, you can't have them all. Which, which ones make the most sense? And then what do we do to focus attention on those? Uh, we're open, but I haven't seen that. That's good. Feels like work to, to be done for sure. Let me go back if I can to, yeah, what's the role of those agricultural communities today? If, if we were once the largest dairy producer in the state, how do we hold on to those things? Do we hold on to those things? Or are those small farmers landowners in those spaces, are they, do they still play a role in what the future of Benton County and the future of this community is going to look like? They do. Sure. Particularly in those communities. I mean, the, the, the agriculture farming influence, particularly along the 59 corridor on the West side is really, really important. I don't see that going away anytime soon. 
What I wish is there is a way that we could handle this growth and prosperity and that role could still be enhanced. I don't know what the answer to that is. As far as the role of the cities go, you know, cities are in an interesting spot because they have to promote growth in their city. At times that's not agriculture growth. It's not related to agriculture at all. And so I'm not sure what role they're playing in promoting agriculture. And, you know, I think that the days of when livestock auctions happened every day or whatever, you know, whatever those farming activities were. And I'm not, a, I don't have farming back here. I think a lot of that's diminished, but I'm not sure farming works that way anymore either. Like poultry farming doesn't work that way, for example. So I do think it's a change. It's evolved. You know, farming, farming's a lot different than it used to be. And I think one of the, one of the things, again, I'm going to get out of my expertise real quick, but we have the most efficient, effective farmers in the world. It takes far fewer people to produce much more food today than ever before. And it's also a high tech business. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of technology involved with farming. So I'm not sure that the days of old and how farming operated are the way they are today at all anymore. So I'm not sure the cities feel a huge role in promoting that. Mm -hmm. That's good. A good, interesting perspective. Thank you for, yeah. for sharing that. I think there's a lot of conversations that revolve around how do we balance or what is the role or how, do, how does all of that work today? And I think it's a, a question now. There's a lot of passion behind those questions and positions. I actually even think the term farm might be antiquated because there's a lot of different kinds of agriculture activities that happen. I mean, they're, one of the trendy things now is this farm to table to help supply the restaurants in, in along the 49 quarter. And that's great. Nothing wrong with that. That's a lot different than a commercial dairy farm or than a poultry operation. I mean, so, so agriculture, I think particularly for those, those of us that live in Bentonville, I'm, I'm one of those, or, or in any of our cities that don't have a lot of relationship directly with farming. My relationship is through this job. My, my heritage is not though. You learn that farm is a catch-all, kind of like almost you would say retail. You know, retail encompasses an awful lot of things now. Farming does as well. I've got a few more questions for you, and then I'll, I'll set you about back to the business of the county. What are you most excited about for Benton County? Oh, man. So I, I get to go around the state professionally. I don't travel around the country professionally much anymore, but I've been around a lot of this country. This really is one of the best places to live on the whole planet. It just, it just is. And all of the issues and everything we've talked about, I don't see that changing anytime soon. I really don't. I mean, we're going to have issues with infrastructure and land use, and we're going to have it. Of course, we're going to have issues. Everybody's got issues, but this is a great place to, it's a great place to work. It's a great place to raise a family. That hasn't changed. That's not going to change anytime soon. What are your hopes for the future of this county? That we don't lose the ingredients that make what I just said happen. And I don't think we will. We have a really strong base and, and I'll, and I'll, I'll credit some of these companies and these entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, you know, Sam Walton and the Simmons and Hunts and the folks that, you know, I know that a lot of them get a lot of criticism, but let's be clear. They form the foundation of what has led to what a great place this is to be now. And I know that, that not everybody agrees with some of the things that happen out of the business sector here. But by and large, this is a pretty darn great place to be. And, and we have a combination of having an entre entrepreneurial spirit, unbelievable economic opportunity. I think we have relatively conservative values that, that I think attract people here. And I think people feel safe here. I think they feel safe here economically. I think they feel safe here physically. I think they feel safe here to raise their families. And, and that's just, that's, that's what this future looks like as far as I can see. Let me ask you. The opposite of that question, what are your fears for this place? I actually don't have too many. I actually don't have too many really well-founded fears. I don't, I think about my hometown of Tucson, Arizona. They've got real fears there. You know, I think about some other parts of the country that have real fears. By and large, I also think there's a lot of great parts of this country too. And this is, this is one of them. What would I be afraid of? I mean, how could the wheels come off here? I suppose the wheels could come off of some sort of commerce thing here. I don't think that'll happen. I don't think the fundamental nature and character of this place is going to change soon. And I don't think people coming here change that. It drives me crazy when I hear people say, oh, I came from California or New York. Okay, you came from somewhere. <laughs> I mean, at one point, there was just a few people here. We all came from somewhere. And somehow that's enhanced what's happening here. I think that's still going on. I don't, I don't, I don't have any problem with any of that at all. 
arguably we are a much better community for the growth and the diversity that's happened here than we would have been otherwise. And I don't see that changing either. We've used this term wholeness that is maybe a collective understanding, but also may have a personal perspective as well too. I, I'd love to know if I, if I ask you, what does wholeness mean for this county? If you could put words to that. Hmm. I hadn't really thought about that. It's an interesting term. I guess wholeness automatically leads me to believe where do we have gaps? And I think we're fortunate that we don't have a lot of gaps. I mean, I, again, I, I don't hear of too many people, maybe it's just because where I reside, but I don't hear of too many people that come here that don't believe they have a great personal and professional opportunity. And we need to keep that going. To me, that's, that's wholeness. So I don't, I don't know that I can find that much more other than where do we have gaps and we don't have too many. What if I had not asked you today, is there anything related to this conversation that you feel like you'd like to share or reemphasize or anything that we need to, we need to cover? I don't, I don't think so. It's funny. I've had three of these kinds of conversations in the last two months where people have sat down and wanted to do kind of in-depth interviews on kind of taking a, an inventory of, of the community and where we stand and what problems we face and, and where we might be advancing or declining. So I guess there, there must be a lot of conversations going on about, you know, what is, you know, that County 2.0 or 3.0 look like. Uh, I don't know that there's anything else I would add other than I will go back to my own personal experience here, I think has been both incredibly positive and pretty typical. I don't think it's been atypical. I think a lot of people have come to this community kind of wondering what their future holds and have discovered that their future belongs here. I don't think that's a pretty common story. And you, you hear of some that come in and go, but it's more common in the supplier community to go, you know, we've got a lot of neighbors. They work for three or four suppliers, not because of being fired or anything, but because they didn't want to go to headquarters. It's like, yeah, I'm not going to Minneapolis, so I'm going to go work for this other supplier. And you hear of that all the time. I, you know, I know, I know that certainly Walmart has people that come and go, and I know there's a lot of that, but there's a, there's a core to this community that I think a lot of people attach onto. That's great. You know, it's a wonderful place to live and work and play the whole slogan. It's actually true. Well, Judge Mooring, thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you do for this county. Thank you for what you do for this place. Thank you for what you do for my family to try to make this place all that it can be. Obviously, the work that you do is incredibly uh, impactful and, and relevant to, to the formation and shaping of this community. And so I'm grateful for it. I thank you for doing it in, in a way that yeah, demonstrates excellence and a desire to, to work on behalf of, of all of us to try to bring people together to try to understand why we love this place and um, what we can do to make sure that it, it continues in the future. So I'm incredibly thankful for your time and thankful for what you do. And yeah, thanks for letting me sit down and talk with you. Thank you. This was great. Good to spend some time with you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you again to Judge Morin for his insights into the forces that are shaping our county. I take away from these discussions a better understanding of the current way the county is working through the growth of the region and how that is being received by the people who live there. With the point of view that the majority of our problems are being driven by our prosperity, we do have to pause and ask the question, is everyone able to take part in that prosperity? Or maybe who is not? It sounds like progress of the cities won't be slowing down anytime soon, and with an estimated population reaching almost a million people in the next 20 years, there's a lot of work ahead for our community leaders. The people living in the county, like those families who are involved in our agricultural industries, they're an important part of our community and we just can't afford to lose that. While there is still work to do to fully align the priorities of both the urban and rural communities, I'm thankful for the opportunity to sit with Judge Mooring and continue the conversations to understand both our values and what we share. I, I do think we share more than we give ourselves credit for. I hear the calling asking for the cities to continue to prioritize making sure they understand how their growth is impacting the county and the people that call it home. And you know, it may not sound like a big thing, but the simple idea of engaging the cycling community and helping plan the future of growth of the roads to help preserve the county's beauty, way of life, and to learn from the county residents could go a long way towards the future of shaping our place. I think we could use more simple ideas like this especially as the number of people expected to travel our county roads is going to grow. Probably going to grow a lot. 
And in the meantime, I'm going to go check the mail real quick to see if Judge Mooring sent me my appointment to the URSC, you know, the Unimproved Road Society Coalition that I mentioned. In that, maybe I can help plan the gravel roads grading methodology quality in the schedule. I mean, after all, who am I to deny an invitation from the king of the roads? The route that goes along with this episode is called the county, and it's designed to let you experience the city and county growth, boundaries, and where the farmlands become housing developments, where the cities and the counties basically are bumping into each other. This is not necessarily a scenic route with much gravel, but it's purposeful, and it matters. It starts at the Benton County Courthouse, and you'll make your way west out of Bentonville. You'll go through many new subdivisions that were once farmland, and you'll eventually turn south to clip a small remaining section of the county through existing agricultural land. Judge Mooring mentioned that almost all the dairy farms are now gone from the county. But on this route, you'll see one as we prepare to cross Highway 12. This dairy farm is AAA Farms. It was established in 1919 and is an Arkansas Century farm. What this means is that they can trace the ownership of this farm through the same family back more than a hundred years. This farm is surrounded by new housing subdivisions on all sides. It is still considered county land, but the city of Bentonville has this small parcel surrounded with zoning of all kinds. We'll talk more about the city in the coming episodes, but after more than a hundred years of farming, time certainly seems to be closing in from all sides. The route crosses Spring Branch Creek and Little Osage Creek on Mill Dam Road. There's a beautiful stone dam as you cross the bridge over Little Osage Creek before a short climb back into Bentonville. And as you head back into town from the south, you'll pass the Bentonville Airport, Osage Park, and then back to the county courthouse. Coming up in the next episode, I sit with Leif Kinberg, the executive director of the Illinois River Watershed Partnership, to understand how this large geographic area that spans both Benton and Washington counties works how it impacts our communities, both urban and rural, and the impact of our water and land use to our neighboring communities to the west, like the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma, and eventually back to the rest of the state of Arkansas. Here's a short preview of the episode to come. We will care for what we actually feel connected to and, and, um, and preserve what we feel connected to. And so it's so important to, to develop the next generation of folks that actually really appreciate that. But if we can, if we could connect everyone to this river in some way, it would transform how we invest in this river and actually preserve it for future generations. The disconnection from it, the detachment from it is troubling to its future. I look forward to sharing this full discussion with Leaf in the episode to follow. The work that he is helping to lead is incredibly relevant to inform the growth strategies in both Benton and Washington County. And I'll leave you today with the music of Ashley McBride. She was born in Waldron, Arkansas, and I first heard Ashley through city sessions in Bentonville. She was in the corner of a living room singing while everyone else stood around and talked to each other. Little did they know that they were in the room with a future Grammy Award winner, Country Music Association Award winner, three-time Academy of Country Music Award winner, nominee for a daytime Emmy, or that she would earn one of country music's crowning achievements when she is invited to become a member of the Grand Old Opry by none other than Garth Brooks. Enjoy this from Ashley McBride as she sings about her father, who was a farmer, a doctor, and a preacher. So if you're listening to Spotify, the episode will roll right into the song. And if not, see the show notes for links to listen to the music.